The gospel of Jesus Christ is a time machine that's been zooming back and forth from past, present, future for the past 2,000 years. Look at how the Apostle Paul describes the gospel. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there's no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It actually means keep falling short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an expiation, as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. That's about as complicated as building a time machine. Holy smokes. Look at those words all put together. Taking those words apart though becomes really critical and I'll try to do it quickly. Righteousness of God. That's not an attribute of God. Righteousness of God through the law and the prophets is the faithful action of God. It's an action of God that supports the relationship that God already has with the world. In the Old Testament throughout it, righteousness is always that, an action that fulfills the obligations of a relationship, and it's such an action that it's sometimes translated from the Hebrew into English as salvation, or victory, or deliverance. But now, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. And how does it get disclosed? Look at the words that Paul uses and why. Why is because all have sinned and keep falling short of the glory of God. That is to say, while God has been righteous in his relationship with the world since the first day, all have not been. We are all unrighteous. We all have sinned and keep falling short of the glory of God. We are all guilty as all get out. Judgment Day is a scary time. Paul has already talked about it, as I said, in the first two chapters of Romans. Judgment Day, look out, the wrath of God to come. But they, the all, are now justified through the redemption as a sacrifice of atonement. What do those words mean? They're coming from a different time, but what, what are they portraying? Paul has to find ways, metaphors, images to present this message that he'll later call in search, unsearchable, inscrutable. How do you get across something that's unsearchable and inscrutable in a communication? You've got to use words that will communicate, justify. What does that mean? It's very closely related to the word righteousness in Greek, actually. What does it mean? It, it means that in a court case where you and I and all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God are obviously totally guilty and God nevertheless says, I declare you innocent. I declare you righteousness and therefore you are in spite of ourselves. It's an image right out of the law court. And then he says through the redemption. We're talking about the story of redemption here. What is redemption? It comes from Paul's world of the slave market. Redemption is the release from bondage of a slave. In the Old Testament, you don't actually have the noun redemption. You've got the word redeem, and you've got God as redeemer, and it means one who pays the damages. Actually, the next of kin, the closest relative, who pays the damages so that the accused one can go free. And the sacrifice of atonement, that in the, in the older RSV, comes out as expiation. Now, isn't that good? Justify, redemption, expiation. Wow, D sacrifice of atonement is much clearer. It refers to the ritual of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. From Leviticus 16, it has to do with the spilling of blood on the altar 
uh, uh, spilling of blood actually on the mercy seat, on the Ark of the Covenant, so the tabernacle can be pure. All those words, Paul says, have come to us because of the death of Jesus on a cross by his blood, not the blood of a bull or a goat. His blood. But look at how many times the word no appear, uh, now appears in that. But now is the way it starts. Now. And then he talks about former sins, former times. But then at the present time, and his last sentence is now. Now, now, now. It's a present situation he's talking about because of the past. God wiping away the sins of the past. And, and decades before Paul wrote this, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And it has future implications because on the day of judgment, though we are guilty, we will all be declared justified, righteous, and acquitted. Past, present, future, all come together in this one passage, a very complicated passage about the Word of God, but profoundly connecting us past, present, future. Faith is the issue in it all. It says we can only accept this in faith. Faith means we hear the good news and say, yes. Hold up your green card. <laughs> faith means only God can do what I cannot possibly do through my own religious actions my own moral behavior, my own reason or strength, even my own theology. I cannot stand before the judgment of God in any other way than guilty. Only God can make me innocent, justify me, and set me free, redeem me, because Christ has wiped away my sin, atone for me. A friend of ours has been coming to our house for the past five years to study the Bible and to talk about theology. She brings with her a lot. She brings with her a broken marriage, teenagers that far exceed the word challenge. She brings a career on hold, a history of addiction, but she also brings a lot of blessings. This is one she brought one day. She, she came in and we sat down at the kitchen table where we always did our Bible study. And she said, I want to talk about Leviticus 16. I said, oh, okay. And so I'm off on my theological lecture about the Day of Atonement and the ritual we just discussed, how the blood gets spilled on the, on the mercy seat and all of a sudden the, the tabernacle is cleansed and and then I said, and the next thing that happens is that the priest takes a live goat and stands it there and puts his hands on the live goat and confesses his own sins and the sins of all the people. And then the goat gets sent away into the wilderness. Let's call her Mary. She said kindly, well, that's really what I want to talk about. It was, she didn't say, well, you finally got there, but... It's what she meant. That's really what I want to talk about. She said, I read this story, and I imagine myself as part of the crowd, that, that my sins, along with the sins of all the others, were loaded on this poor innocent animal, and it was sent off. And she said, I, I can't tell you what it meant to me watching this goat take away my fears, my doubts, my mistakes, my selfishness, and walk further and further away into the wilderness, and then all of that just disappeared into thin air. The story does, of course, point to the atoning death of Jesus. It's a history of redemption. All of this history wiping away sin and freeing us is the result of God's righteousness for you and for me and for all who say 
Yes.